And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one good brother and one good sister here in the temple. In the red corner, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, as well as, as, well as the man making... Making so making salty ass game devs cry. Hmm. It's a way of life down here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good brother Xanatrix. and making her making her making her return. The sh the um the a the average Bayesian as she calls herself, <laughs> and the woman of a thousand cat boys. <laughs> Good sister. Spoiler. How you t how you two oh, doing well. tonight? I'm just happy that I've officially marked myself as your eternal bane on Twitter. <laughs> it's in bio now, guys. We're not doing pronouns in bio anymore. Instead, we're marking our eternal rivals. Or, you know, just the person we pester all the time. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know, I think Mickey is more into cat boys in general than I am. This is coming from the person who titled themselves the cat boy connoisseur for weeks. I never titled myself that. That was Dio. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is also coming from the person who I definitively proved is most like a cat. You say that because you haven't met the rest of Cat Herd. Um, I'm sure I would definitively say they're all cats. The only yes, person... I am the least cat among them. The only person that I acknowledge as possibly being a cat is Nerd Wonder, and she's not here right now. <laughs> and to be and to be fair, Nerd Wonder does doesn't exactly do herself any favors with avatar design or the fact that she is very squeaky. I'm not squeaky. You can be. <laughs> Anybody can be squeaky if you squeeze them hard enough. That's Even funny. Goku was squeaky. <laughs> but, but this is an this is another of our this is going to be another entry in our reconstructions, and it's going to be it's going to be in a it's going to be in a familiar sense. Be, and this is a case. It's very much a case of having to check my ambitions, but not completely abandon my ambitions. Or to, because well, some of us demand the finer things in life. And in this case, he says. <laughs> in this case, the finer things inclu include me, include me trying to trying trying to trying to fix a partic a particular annoyance. <laughs> because you see, for this one, this is going to be the first of a four parter. Not four parts in a row, obviously. I don't want to exhaust the to the topic, and I want to give other topics room to breathe. Plus, the only time that we've ever done multi parts is because technology decided to fuck us, or things just went way too long. Mm -hmm. High world building the very first time. <laughs> in our defense, we had no idea what we were doing at that mo at that time, and we kind of bit off more than we could chew. I think it was just the map, Monk. There were way too many countries. Blame Asgar for that. Noted. But this week, the top the topic of reconstruction after we after we've done so well with do with doing much better versions of things like Star Wars, the Le the Legend of Korra, and K Common Rider Ryuki and Common Rider Decade, as well and as Captain Marvel. And ca and Captain Marvel and managing to somehow fit managing to somehow salvage the worst Power Rangers season ever. <laughs> and I can I can say ever because I guarantee you, no matter even if even if um the Hasbro era shits the bed in the next five years, it's not going to be as bad as Operation Overdrive was. <laughs> and so far, they have not shit the bed. Although they've only had two shows to work with, so. Give it time, they will. 
There's going to there's gonna be a dud because nobody bats a thousand. It just hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel sorry for them in, in a decade or so when they inevitably have to adapt Don Brothers. <laughs> Good fucking luck on that. <laughs> mm. I'm but still, I'm still mixed on Don Brothers, but uh, but getting back on the rails. This week, the re the the target of our reconstruction is Ruby. And I know some of you might be tilting your heads and going, wait, didn't you cover Ruby and then abandon it weeks ago? Yes, I months did. Ago. Months ago at this point. Yes. We did. We did. We did. At we did attempt a reconstruction of the, fir of the first six volumes. We had planned on doing a 12-volume thing with, Ru with it. However, I decided to shit-can it two way to... Two spots in for ver for various reasons and but I'd rather let the evangelist of the te of the temple and of the watch to give to give the gist as to why I shit canned it which is something we haven't done up until that point all right well ladies and gentlemen those of you who have watched any of our reconstructions know that the reason we take a project on for reconstruction is in is in order to address the opportunities missed in its foundation in order to build a product that subjectively can be seen as better in some cases objectively better hi captain marvel <laughs> but uh low bar i'll give you that yes um but we want to make our own product of it is the thing we take the themes the characters the setting we take the sandbox as we've been made to understand about the sandbox, and we build something with it that usually ends up extremely different, even by the first set of, uh, of changes. It branches out further and further until you have something that is only recognizable as being associated with the origin because it has the same imagery, I guess is the best word to put it as. With the previous Ruby Reconstruction episodes, uh, Monk and myself both felt that we were remaining too close to the source material and also becoming too mired in the minutiae and details. That's never how our reconstructions have worked. Our reconstructions have always been, you know, maybe you change a detail if it's super pertinent. One of the smaller details can cause far-reaching consequences but things are usually broad strokes or as monk likes to put it tears and tent poles the tears and tent poles approach from gargoyles specifically mm -hmm. and we weren't doing that anymore not only were we not adding enough of our own influence into the sandbox we had been given because we were taking too many pages from a book that is flawed as it at its basis or a book that didn't even have binding or a spine, considering they have no series Bible! Yeah. But we were also, again, getting mired in the details. So Monk made the executive decision to uh, part ways with the project to begin anew. Um, it's also an unfortunate side effect of this that our previous uh, collaborator, the wonderful Lady Saber, uh, and we had differing visions for what was going on. Mm -hmm. So she decided that it was Monk's show and she was going to exit stage left. Lady Saber, we still love you. You're still our friend. There's no hard feelings. And we're sorry you couldn't work further with us on this. Mm -hmm. But thank you again for all of your cooperation up until that point. And that's essentially where we are now. We've collaborated with some new collaborators, one of which could not make it today, unfortunately. Still has yet to make her monastery debut. And of course, our lovely spoiler here. She's oh. here on her second show. Treat her as you would treat anyone else in the monastery, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we are working with a new idea. We've been... M making sure we actually had a lot of 
uh, conversations and discussion about details that may need to be changed and what parts of the foundation are no longer necessary or could do better in a different context. And so with that, we have this new inaugural episode of Reconstructing Ruby. Yes. Now, as far, now as, far as what Ruby is... We d that's something that doesn't need an explanation. It was the pr it was the brainchild of of Ma of Monty of Monty Ohm, God rest his soul, and so and se and several individuals at Ro at Rooster Teeth. A lot of the writing is being hand is being handled by Miles Luna and Carrie Shawcross. I will have words about both of them in due time. <laughs> um, Ma. Monty had his Monty had his had his own long term plans, including the the idea of it being a twelve volume series, which is why I went with a rule of twelve, and why we're, and why this is going to be um, four arcs in sets of three volumes. But that's something that we already that are, had already made clear about. Um, as far as far as what Ruby is meant to be, um. A spit a spin of an amalgamation of fa of fairy tales with some inspiration from Avatar and Final Fantasy VII, despite what despite what some members of the fandom would argue otherwise. And speaking of that, let me address the FNDM for one moment. Hi, my name's Mildra. These are the brothers and sisters of the Temple, also known as the Geek Watch. We are going. We are going to like. We are going to likely hurt your feelings on this matter, because we are going to say some thing, some uncomfortable truths about Ruby. If you feel, if you are so, if you are so inclined to call to call us various names, please do. Please do so. Please do so. We would love. We would love to print them out and make the and make f those words for excellent kindling, as it is still very very cold where I live. Because old man winter won't fucking leave. <laughs> so also get in line. There's a queue about two miles long. You'll have to start at the back. Mm -hmm. Think of it like waiting at the DMV from hell. The DMV is hell. Tautology, monk. Lower this level of hell. Low bar, but okay. <laughs> So now, now that I've now that I've gotten that now that I've gotten that taken care of, um, I don't want to I don't want to belab belabor the belabor the point on what Ruby is because with how with how widespread it's be, it's become over the years, there's no re there's no reason to do that, and I I don't want to come off like the like the series has no merit. There. De there definitely is there definitely is merit in the visual styling and the creativity that it has fostered. Um, there the fact that the, the fact that there's five different takes on Ruby when it comes to tabletop, I think speaks volumes. Um, Not to mention, Monk, if there were no merit, we wouldn't be doing a reconstruction. Yes, for for the. For those who are for those who aren't aware and are coming at, are coming into this as their first taste of our reconstruction policy, when we choose to do a reconstruction of a project, it is not out of hate. It is out, it is out it is sometimes out of frustration and an attempt to amend that frustration into something a little more constructive. More often than not, when we do we look for a certain type of show in order to do a reconstruction. Something that has a degree of merit to it, and with a few tweaks, could be some could be something much better than what it is. But something that's outright bad or 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 just outright trash is to, is too bad for us. And something something that has enough redeeming qualities to the point where it to the point where the changes that we could make are minimal is not bad enough. It's like Goldilocks. We need something not too hot, not too cold, something that's just right. Except in this case, we're not dealing with three bears. We're dealing with millions. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. bear out there, I see you. You all have the name Ruby Fan printed on you somewhere. 
Now, with that with that in mind, why why would I know some people might uh, might argue that there's nothing wrong with the show and y- yada yada. And why would we con- <laughs> why would we consider this? Well, first things first, it's time for us to talk about what the fuck a series bible is, because this is going to be crucial. I'd like to interject that even like the most avid Ruby fan, as a former and recovering Ruby fan, uh, even the most avid Ruby fan would acknowledge that Volume 4 wasn't... It was really boring. They just walked the entire time. And we're walking, and we're walking. There are ways, to, there are ways to make walking interesting. I mean, there's a whole lot of walking in Journey to the West. <laughs> yeah, and that wasn't it. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole lot of walking when you go from Fisherman's Horizon to S-Star with Renoa on your back. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait. Final Fantasy VIII. I'm going to get hate. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, if it, yeah, if anyone's mad at us for if anyone's mad at us for the fact that we like Final Fantasy VIII, I just want to make you, I just want to let you all know we don't care. Like I, like I said, some there are some people who who go out of, who go out of their way to not, to not pick to not pick on certain fandoms or like we have a we have a different policy here in the temple. We hold these truths to be self evident that all are cremated equal, and that includes us, <laughs> as we as we we are no stranger to roasting each other just as much as we roast everything else. But rails now. I'd like to claim credit for the concept of a series Bible, but that but that's not the case. I don't know who came up with the concept. I first heard it when I was listening to an interview with one of the with one of the episode directors of Are You Afraid of the Dark and a few episodes of Animorphs. Um alone. Are You Afraid of the Dark was a better experience for him in his words, but he talked about the concept of a series Bible. A document that has the relevant characters, relationships, plot lines, basically basically a primer for where where a given show is at and where it's supposed to be going writing writing wise. Usually usually as a guidebook for the for the actors. And it can be just as important for everyone else too. Mm-hmm. And the point the point is is that you need is that you need to have that kind of thing so that there is a degree of consistency with all of the moving parts in a production. All the more so when you're dealing with when you're dealing with more moving parts, as you would in say a, a TV a um, serialized TV series as opposed to a standalone film. Now. With that in with that in mind, Ruby, if they have a series Bible, they're not very good at sticking to it. Or it's a series Bible that's constantly being edited, which kind of defeats the point of having a series Bible to begin with. Mm-hmm. Or to put it one way, the 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 writing is so advanced, even the writers don't know where it's going to go. You know. You're technically right. Advancing rearward is still an advance in one direction. This is also this is also known as modern World of Warcraft writing. <laughs> uh, I wish World of Warcraft was better, but wishes were horses. Your, we've already come. Co- your writing that. look like Steven Universe's animation, or Steve, or Steven Universe's um. Everything, or Steven Universe is everything. But the pro- there is there is the problem there is the problem where there are there are ideas presented, but not a lot of thought is given into the consequences of of those ideas, or the or um or put or put in relying solely on rule of cool. And don't get me wrong. I got no beef with Rule of Cool. I love me some Rule of Cool. I mean, for fuck's sake, Zan, Zan and I argue all the time about about character action games. We are we are no strangers to Rule of Cool, 
but you can you cannot you cannot try to do a story with any degree of seriousness while still relying on ru actually let me take that back because it ha because that has been done what yeah, I its name is devil may cry 5 yeah. <laughs> what i'm getting at is that rule of cool should be a spice and not a bandage it can only carry you so far mm -hmm. it in in a more precise fashion, you can have your entire game story, whatever, full of rule of cool. Again, I'm pointing to Devil May Cry Five and going, "Go play it. It's fucking good." Mm -hmm. Um, but you cannot use that to plug the holes. If there are holes, you need to you need to fix them or plug them with something else. Hopefully, fix them because fixing them makes for a better structure. If, you only have ten fingers and toes. If you are going to use rule of cool in that manner, then you have to be. Then you have to at least carry yourself with an awareness of how ridiculous things are getting. Um, some could argue be, bayonetta counts in, counts into that category. Or, or you know, a Toriyama. Yeah. The man knows how ridiculous Dragon Ball is. He doesn't care at this point. Mm-hmm. That and I'm, that and I'm pretty sure he's just he's just he's just mentally checked out after all the wars he's had with his editors. But get but the reason that the reason why I bring up the series Bible, it and the and the lack thereof in this, aside from the aside from that little bit of consistency, is the is the fact that the that Luna and Shaw and Shawcross seem to ha seem to have this idea of instead of instead of developing the characters that they have, just add more characters. I mean, for a for one would think that a web that a web series would try and keep things relatively simple when it comes to the when it comes to the cast. I mean, you look you look at other web series of that time and and since, and they generally try and keep it to a small cast. And hell, our one of our favorite Tokusatsu writers tries to keep things to a small cast. But by the end of what... Volume One, you have eight pro you have eight protagonists, se several secondary characters, and at least and at least two antagonists. That's too much. Too much. You've all seen you've all seen the meme of someone spinning plates while sword dance plays in the background. Uh -huh. And of course, subsequent volumes would only exacerbate this issue. There right. is also the fact that there w that um the series Bible thing can also can also be a tr can also tie itself to art and art style. And if you look at the way the art style has if, has devolved, the emphasis on sim on simple colors, almost in almost in a four color setup, has has begun to degrade. Where where think where things that would be considered primary co primary colors on characters are lost in a sea of excessive details. And and this all and when it comes to wet when it comes to weaponry, especially with that whole it's also a gun thing that became a meme in and of itself. The the methodology of using the, of using those weapons in interesting ways fell by the wayside as well, because th because they were more interested in quantity instead of quality. The if you're gonna do excessive amount to, of detail like that to the point of making everything look very very much pops out and in a jarring way from things like backgrounds and and normal background characters you know people in the streets and such um you can't do it with an ensemble cast this large the even the great man himself kentaro miura uh may he rest in peace um 
limited his cast within Berserk, which is an excessively detailed manga. Um, you, there are there are huge amounts of detail there, but they're focused on the true main characters. The people with the highest amount of detail are always Guts and Griffith. Mm. Always. Everybody else starts getting lower tiers of detail by importance. Casca's usually next, along with um, people like uh, Shirka, Farnes, uh, oh. Serpico? Ser- yeah, Serpico. I, I was like, it's not, it's, there's an R in there somewhere. Um, the the other members of the party get slightly lower amounts of detail, though they're still very detailed. Um, and then, of course, the two joke characters who are also really good helpers, Puck and the other fairy whose name I never, ever remember. Um, they are rendered looking like little dandelion puffs unless they're doing something important. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with with the fact that everyone in Ruby that is somehow important, even in the, the smallest amounts of importance, are getting more and more detailed. Um, you're detracting from your main cast, actually. Yeah. Yeah. That it also me, especially when that new, especially when that has to play, has to um, compete for space with all with new characters that keep getting added every every volume and then forgotten in subsequent volumes. Again, not <laughs> thinking more than more than one step ahead. Oh, and I I um I would be remiss if I didn't point didn't point out that in preparation for doing this again I ended up going through a lot of a lot of videos and a lot of research to the point that we have our own little series bible and one particular youtuber that I do that I do want to give props to is the judgmental critter whose video series on some of Ruby's problems helped me in a, in a lot of ways to structure how how to go about this and of course of course in the process of in the process of that, as well as the as well as some of the very baffling decisions that happened la- that happened later on, looking at you, Ironwood, that was st- that's that was still pants on head, stupid. I, I, f- I, will I will pro- we will probably be cheating a little bit when it comes to this reconstruction, but it's not the first time that we've done that we've done that, so. With all of with all of that preamble out of the way, with a with a with a series that has become become a lot of a lot of flash and not a lot of substance, one that believes that more characters is more important than developing characters, and one that be, and one that believes in not utilizing the things that brought it to the dance. Let us have a go. <laughs> so. On the cheating thing, we need let's get to, let's get that out of the way first. Mm-hmm. The reason I say cheating is because we're not going to be using the exact same episode structure that the first three volumes did. Now, those of you who may, those of you familiar with our reconstructions and have seen and have seen what we did with Sword Art Online, we that had a built-in assumption that we were doing a 24 episode season focused solely on the Einkrad arc of SAO instead of trying to play half seas with two, with two arcs in one season. Not that the fairy dance arc is any better. Uh, Arguably, not... it's worse. Oh, it's a... I'm not going to deny that, but tr- but um but trying to but trying to shove two arcs into one into one into one season like that was a bad idea, so mm-hmm. we decided not to do that. In that same vein, for th- with the- because of the fact that from volume four onward, you have a structure of around 12, 24 minute episodes, basically the the kind of thing that would be standard fare for any streaming se- series. We're going to be taking that. As- we're going to be applying that to the first three volumes. So everything will be explored in 12 24-minute episodes per volume. Yes. Now, now that I've gotten that now that I've gotten 
that part out of my system. The other thing we need to address is the fact that a lot of the, in preparation for doing this, we ended up spending several hours doing workshop calls. Because if there's one thing that we really needed to nail down, and maybe this is our own biases, it is world building. And actually, actually making clear some degree of consistency with the world of Remnant. In short, the world of Remnant in the actual Ruby series feels like a set piece or traveling between set pieces and is not as living or as breathing as a wider world possibly should be. In many of our reconstructions, a lot of the things we do are touch on how the wider world would be influenced by the changes made to characters and events. Uh, because the world, nothing happens in a vacuum, even in a fictional world. Mm -hmm. you, ha you have to have a consistent built world to have a consistent uh, narrative within it. So part of the reason we hammered down on world building was to make sure our world was vibrant, was living, was breathing. Would you care to give an example from one of our previous reconstructions on, the, on that particular matter? Um, I think the best example is actually from our uh, Star, Star Wars sequel film, Reconstruction, where the actions of either Finn or Rey or third character whose name I always forget because I don't care about the sequels. Um, oh. <laughs> yes, Poe. Yeah, Poe. Um, how they start affecting people's opinions within the galaxy, how that causes them to build an actual following for that final big battle at the very end of the story that we made. Um, in addition, how this torch was passed from Han and Leia and Luke to these new people. How we ch how the changes to Finn and Poe and Rey affected Kylo Ren. All of these things had ripple effects that went out further and further, but we actually had to establish how things were occurring within the galaxy in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because even the films didn't know. Exactly! We had to change that! Yeah. Ugh. And that that was an early instance of cheating because we, th because we threw in Grand Admiral Thrawn and, Ma and Mara Jade because we fucking can. Because Grand Admiral Thrawn and Mara Jade are way better villains than what was given to... Fuck Snoke. Yeah. Fuck Snoke. But because of that, we end up spending quite a bit of time trying to, fir first off, decipher what what the what certain lore aspects with Remnant were, because in some cases we had multiple stories and and neither one of them was exactly consistent with each other. And while the concept of unreliable narration is a thing. It's not something that you can use as a get out of jail free card. Yeah, unreliable narratives are good to cause certain tonal shifts or plot shifts, but you can't use it as a as a panacea. It's not possible. Especially since there's an attempt at a theme of fairy tales having a hint of truth within them. That whole line of what's your favorite fairy tale usually usually being a a pretext to some to some truth about the world that's just that's just been hidden within 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 fairy tales and corrupted through time as fo as folk tales tend to naturally occur however that doesn't mean that you can use that to plug the holes especially when there's it's one thing to have a little bit of a leak on your ship it's another thing to hit the iceberg or or hidden or hidden island off the coast of Italy. Hi, Costa Concorda. <laughs> so, while while a lot of a lot of a lot of the terminology that will be that will be getting into regarding uh, regarding our take on on remnant won't be won't be handled in this particular part. There are there are some things that we that we will that we will go into 
um, one of the, one of them, I'd say one one of the big ones that I think I think we should bring up is the is what we did regarding the faunus. In canon, I mean the, the faunus are 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 a are a ham-fisted um, allegory. Yeah, the faunus are are not just a ham-fisted allegory. Um, how how many stories was it? Three, five of their alleged creation. Three. Yeah. Uh I thought it was just a, an excuse to have a cat girl that they then bent over backwards for. I mean, that's actually very likely the truth. Because if the if you have a cat girl, but then you have animal people, you can introduce all the other type of neko mimi. Or mm -hmm. kimono mimi, excuse mm -hmm. me. Which is why they also have a bunny girl. Mm -hmm. Which... If you want to, if you want to do that, all all well, all well and good. But the the prob the problem with the allegory that they ended up going with is the fact that they they were so they decided to go into it so strongly that any and every character every character who is a faunus has to address it in some shape, form, or fashion. Mm-hmm. And that is that is very much bottlenecking the kind of characters that you the kind of characters and stories that you can tell. Mm -hmm. And so we we didn't do that with them. No. <laughs> we had a we had a different approach. Now, the approach that we, now putting aside the origins because I don't want to cover that yet. The appro the approach that we have is is that they t is that faun faunus were it were a not necessarily an offshoot but something that but something that but something that um, started out concurrent w concurrent around the same time as humanity, yep. but popped up around the same period. Yeah. Yep. But they tend to they tend to lean more towards practical more towards practicality in 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 a cultural mindset more th more than more than the moral codes of humans. Basically, what gets the job done with the least amount of of loss, rather than what gets the job done in a way that aligns with a moral compass. Mm -hmm. There, that that's not to say that there was that there's never been conflict between hum, between human and faunus tribes, but that conflict is more is more about compete competing for resources or differences in in uh, in philosophy. Yeah, differences in the how mm -hmm. or the why rather than in the what. Yeah, i.e. Any, i.e., any other conflict in human history. Yep. Mm -hmm. Essentially, essentially, our faunus are more pragmatic humans. They're 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 not so different from humanity that they are something, I guess, uh, singularly unique. They're they're close enough that, um, you know. Cross species love can occur, obviously, mm -hmm. and they they can both get along with and not get along with each other. It, it, it's it's no different than any two tribes of humans throughout history. Mm -hmm. Hold on one moment. Continue continuing on. Um, now, what one, one might one might ask what. One might ask, where does the white fang factor into that? We'll get into we'll get into that in a moment, but as far as the details, but for the time being, I will simply say, the white fang are a are an all are an all faunus group of highly skilled mercenaries. Ones who ones who ones who work for ones who work for the highest bidder. Again, that faunus pragmatism. We have skills. People want these skills. Whoever can pay most for these skills gets them. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Have we now as far as whether or not we've changed the concept of grim? No. It's lar that is largely the same. Um when it comes to the concept of what of a huntsman or a huntress, the only thing that we've the only thing that we've really changed is the is the early part of it, i.e. Originally, originally they were entirely combat focused, but as time went on, they they started to take on multiple roles. And this affected how their particular uh, learning and their particular equipment um, b began to evolve, and we'll get into that. Yeah, this is this is what this is why a. A cat, a, a the idea of an academy for huntsmen is considered necessary because it is not enough to just be a skilled fighter in order to be the, in order to be a huntsman. anybody anybody can be a skilled fighter, but a but a huntsman is expected to be able to fulfill multiple roles. Sometimes that might sometimes that might be um, something more diplomatic. Sometimes it might be. Um, some something more police or bounty hunter associated. Sometimes it might be all of the above. But hunters are a multifaceted group of people at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and much like how the White Fang is an extremely skilled group of mercenaries that go to the highest bidder, the hunters are an extremely skilled group that it, a, a paramilitary group, essentially. That is also sometimes seen as a semi-associated arm of the military of whatever um, country they may be in, mm -hmm. though they are beholden to no one country. Mm -hmm. Now, since we since we mentioned the fact that that Ruby likes that that Ruby as a series likes to throw all of the characters into the pot. The approach that we're taking is something not too far removed from one of from one of our favorite writers of Tokusats, Riku Sanjo, who is responsible for work, for works such as Common Rider Double, as well as um, Kyoryuji in in Super Sentai. And he in manga he's also responsible for Beat the Vandal Buster, but. It, but his approach is centered around a small cast that is high, that is significantly more detailed. Yeah. Um, even with something like I can hear people snickering in the background, but Kyoryuji had ten had ten Sentai members. Yes, and Riku Sanjo. You'll notice that he kept the core six very detailed, and the other four are kind of there. So it still applies. Mm -hmm. And the ten, the ten member thing was something that was enforced on him. He and in, in fact, I get, I've always gotten the feeling that he had, that he had far more fun writing for, writing for things like com, like Common Writer than he did with Super Sentai because of the fact that he could get away with a smaller cast. Indeed, but Rails Monk. Mm -hmm. The point is because of th because of that, we're not going to be all that interested in trying to introduce new characters as it goes on, and try and focus on the core the core two teams that are focused on throughout are focused on throughout and in the first three volumes, specifically Team Ruby. Yep, and I can already hear the whining in the background, but. But there are so many good teams. No, there are so many teams that you like the idea of that are one-dimensional pastiche stickers on a background. Like, I literally have no idea why team... What is it? Neon? It even exists <laughs> other than for style. It, and and thus my point is... is uh, is shown. Yes, Team Ruby uh, is our primary focus... But uh, we will also be following Team Juniper, mm -hmm. and these are our these are our core teams. Um, we are also doing the same thing on the idea of the bad guys, but you know the bad guys were not super spread out at first to begin with. It was just 
Salem and her four henchmen with a primary focus on Cinder. And th- and um, Cin- and Cinder's gr- Cinder's gr- and even even with that, we didn't see si- we didn't see Salem in canon until the post credit scene at the end of Volume Three. Yeah, but it was but the but what the closest that we had to villains was Torchwick and and Salem's faction which has never even gotten the proper name it's just referred to as Salem's faction which is kind which is kind of lame I still think it's and funny not Sa- that not uh Sa- not Salem Cinder what the hell am I thinking I still think that uh that the, that the abbreviation that was uh, originally come up for Cinder's team um you during our pre <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was hilarious. I mean, it follows the the color name rules. It does, in the best and worst ways. Uh, uh, uh. So, with that with that in mind, because of the fact that we had we had already belabored how Ruby d- that how. Ruby's cast doesn't really develop as the volumes go on. Even wh- even when it seems like there's some degree of development, it's it um it doesn't stick. Or, shallow. Or it, yeah, it is very it is very shallow. I suppose I suppose if there's any analogy I could use, it's big splashes drain the pool of all the water. Yep. So because of that, when it, because of that, we ended up spending a bit of time focusing on what sort of arc that we w- that we would intend for e- for the for the main cast, and for the purposes of volumes one through f- four, again, we're only going we're going to be focusing largely on Team Ruby with a little bit of Team Juniper, if only in a only in a supporting cast um, contrast style, i.e. One team is skilled, but a, but on a little bit dysfunctional. The other team seems to, seems to contrast that with being a bit more put together. Yeah, I I, I would like to point out, Monk. You said volumes one through four, and then yeah, one through vol- three. Yeah, one through three. What? Um, I'm my, my my mind is running faster than my than my mouth. That's a- Sounds like a problem we've all had. Mm-hmm. Now, Even the quiet one in here. Mm-hmm. Now, with with um, with Ruby, with Ruby Rose herself, the arc that we go that we wanted to go with is her des- her desire to, her desire to be a normal a normal quote unquote huntress, but because of, because of situations beyond her control, has to realize that there's a bigger picture than just wanting to be normal. And that, well, because because of responsibilities and and her and her place in things, that that was never in the cards. And even as early as the fact that she you know skipped grades to enter the academy, it can be seen that she is not normal, and it gets at her from time to time. Mm-hmm. Yang, Yang Shao Long, I. We, I believe we we decided to go with her be, her having the good and bad side of a big sister complex. Yeah, she's overprotective of everybody and wants to be the one to stand in front. Mm-hmm. And while the in canon, there's been this idea that she that she's a bit of an adventurer by nature, and I'd say I'd say there's far more of the big sister attitude with her with her than anything else. Yeah. And we our intent is to lean into that but also also to to make clear that that is that that particular approach is a double-edged sword. And in her yep. case the arc is more about learning that she can't that she can't always be a helicopter sibling. That she has to let others be protected by learning to protect themselves sometimes. Mhm. Um, 
I will note with Blake, Blake was in canon was one of the big frustrations with me because she seemed to constantly yo-yo between opening up and then closing off go to go right back to square one again, which happened at least twice. Yeah. I, I would say argue that Weiss was the only one with semi-consistent character writing, and even that mm -hmm. is dubious. But Blake, but Blake was Blake was a series of frustrations, right? And I think the only reason Blake would go back to being shut down is to initiate more conflict because they didn't have any other way to do so. Right. And if I'm if I'm being honest, when when a store when a, when you're having a character do th do things so irrational t for the sake of melodrama, the story does not care about you. And that that is that is a moment that, at the very least for me personally, always makes me snap. Because it's because it's very easy to spot, and once you spot it, you cannot unsee it. And I saw <laughs> that plent I saw that multiple times with Blake. Now, no amount of mind or eye bleach will help you now. Mm -hmm. The. In simplest terms, the arc that we want to go with Blake is being able to open up to others, which I know is a bit cliche, but th but it's impossible for us to talk about that without talking about Adam. And while we while I won't go while we won't go into full details with what we have planned for for Adam yet, give give it time. This is not this is not a relationship thing more of a more of a case of never meet your heroes yep. she saw him from afar and due to the the way he seemed from afar including his natural charisma uh it naturally developed into hero worship as d tends to happen to a lot of people when they're young this is something that's common amongst all people but as monk said never meet your heroes you're quickly disillusioned and I should I should note that instead of the obsessive X, the template that we ended up using for our reconstruction of Adam, which we'll get we'll get to shortly, is more along the lines of Shar Aznable. Somebody who's touched in the head but has a great deal of natural charisma to, to back up their skills. Combine this with the new, extremely pragmatic values that we've given the Faunus. You'll quickly see how this makes him a more effective villain. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, with Weiss, there's there is still that sen there's still that sense of entitlement from be from being a scion of the, of the Schnee family. But the but but beneath that. The big arc with her is want is wanting to live wanting to live up to this idea of chivalry that she's that that she's um engrossed herself in, and t tales of of uh, mem of members of the sh of members of her ancestry that were far were far more noble than the Schnee family's current reputation would imply. He essentially wants to. Uh restore the idea and concept of noblesse oblige in her house and in so doing restore the reputation of her house which is something that was touched on in canon but was never fully explored now i know we mentioned that we were going to focus primarily on team ruby with this but i do want to touch a little bit on one member of team juniper especially that that for a bit that is Jean. So first things first, we are not having Jean be the comic relief. He will not be the butt of every joke. He is not the class clown. No. Instead, Jean is a, is a is to steal a term from Naruto, a genius of hard work. He's our Rock Lee. Mm -hmm. in, in in most in most situations, he's completely out of his depth. He's 
not he's not all that versed in the wider wor in the wider world but he um but he but because of how much he applies himself that's what gets uh, that's what gets attention to him not to mention the fact that i i think something that we uh that we didn't exactly write down but we had discussed was he is absolutely willing to look at his his weaknesses and his failures and know how to grow from them and um and to cover them mm -hmm. so that that way he he can become a more effective person overall again part of that genius of hard work mm -hmm. i know where i lack so i will bring those lacking fields to standard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we are still g that that does still go with um, one particular element that was supposed to be a point of shame, but we're, but we're taking a different approach. Now, within Volume One, I would still keep the I would still keep the um, the du the dust robbery scene that totally totally wasn't inspired by the Cowboy Bebop movie. No, not at all. Oh, as especially since this is it's it's an effective way to first introduce the two ma the two main villains, um, Torchwick and C and Cinder. Now, the thing I'd say one I'd I'd say one of the bit one of the one of the big things to ch to change and one of the and one of the major themes regarding. Um, Regarding Volume One is an orientation and an and um a building of the character of Beacon Academy. Yeah, the Academy should is as much a character and living, breathing piece of the story as Gotham is in Batman co uh, comics, or at least that's what we want to try and achieve. Mm -hmm. Oh. I'd say I'd to use a more to use another example. Consider, um, consider DS consider DS nine in well DS nine. Yeah, the the <laughs> you could not have Deep Space Nine without the actual space station. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't happen. Also, also known also known as Benjamin Sisko's motherfucking pimp house. <laughs> They just can't call it that because it's too because it's too long for the card. But in the in that same in that same vein, the or, the orientation and the and the and the fetch quest to determine team think team things that is that is that is effectively our um our second half of the introduction. Mm-hmm. And while in, while at the by the end of by the end of volume one, by the end of volume one, there you you would have a good idea of the ins and outs of Beacon as well as several professors going with more than just two professors in the in the source material. One of whom has possibly the worst the worst designed blunderbuss I've ever seen. <sighs> is that a blunderbuss? Yes. I it's thought it was a pipe bomb. Oh. It's trying to be a blunderbuss. I thought it was a pipe bomb. Regardless, <laughs> who, regardless who the hell put, regardless, he's stabbing himself every time he fires the thing because of where the axe part of it is. See, that's why I thought it was a pipe bomb. That's decorative uh, shrapnel, right? <laughs> For when the thing blows up in his hand. Yeah, I try. I try not to. I try not to be the. I try not to be the gun guy when it whenever it comes to fantasy firearms. But sometimes certain designs just trigger me. We should submit that onto a uh, Brandon Herrera's cursed gun designs. <laughs> no. No, it's too weeb for him. He's reviewed weeb stuff before. What are you talking about? Oh right, I forgot. Thomas the Dank Engine. <laughs> <laughs> rails though yeah um but through but through this there there are this 
the profess the various professors is go is going to be one way to expound further on aspects of the of um of both the setting as well as the nature of hunters one particular and this is also where we'd get into one thing that was in that's been in the back of my mind for the longest time that's never fully addressed one of the big claims to fame with with ruby has always been the transforming weapon gimmick and there's a lot of things that people have done with the transforming weapon gimmick both officially and in fan work however a question a question that i've always asked is why this became a thing not only why did it become a thing why is it the norm mm -hmm. why are there no hunters using normal weapons such as just a sword and then also having a shotgun why are there no you know no no hunters using just a halberd and then also a crossbow why is it that all of these hunters have some form of variable or transforming weapon and ju and not not even just hunters but just pe but just um martial characters in general yeah, but I think we've now limited those variable weapons back to the hunter system in general. Mm -hmm. And while, cert while certainly rule of cool plays a factor, once again, you can't use that as a bandage. So the approach that we de that we decided is it's a reflection of the versatility expected from hunters. Yep. Since the original hunters were m m uh, mainly military and were thrown into a wide variety of situations, they were expected to have a wide variety of, and a wide venue for attack, different exigencies. Um, they, it would not be uncommon amongst Gen 1 hunters to see them have a weapon belt full of four or five different weapons, much like you might actually see on the horse of a medieval European knight. You know, your morning star, your long sword, your shield, your bow, even a pike or a halberd, for depending on what type of mounted combat they're doing, and a lance. Mm -hmm. this, this is the same idea. Be prepared for as many things as you can be. And They're the Boy Scouts. Yeah. <laughs> and as time and technology progressed, instead of it became more efficient to instead have transforming weapons that could fulfill multiple roles as opposed to carrying a baker's dozen weapons along with you. Because as any soldier will tell you, more weapons means more weight. And more weight will get miserable if you're not careful. I've worn full plate, carried a heater shield on my back with a great sword and long sword, and Morningstar. That shit is heavy, and during Pensick in the middle of summer, holy fuck, I hate it. And I'm not. You already know how much I how much I don't do summer. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it's the summer in Pennsylvania, so it's not as bright. Now, although um, with Mi Minnesota summers can get can can get more humid than than some people might think, and worse, skeeters. Yeah. If I created a virus that eliminated every mosquito, every mosquito in the continental United States, I think I'd probably get the Medal of Honor for it. Mm -hmm. You'd also get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> probably the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. But rails. <laughs> we have a lot to get through, guys. Ra rails. But the point the point is is that because of, because of that versatility and ha and how people are expected to. Um, interpret that versatility. That is the reason why not only are transforming weapons a thing, and would event and would eventually venture out from the from the hunters just just due to proliferation. But a but anybody who's going to an academy in some form is expected to build their own is expected to not only build their own weapon but know how to maintain it. 
Yeah. I mean, first of all, it's a pa- it's a it's a matter of practicality. Every warrior should know how to maintain their own weapons. But it's also a matter of personalization. All semblances are not created equal. Mm-hmm. So creating a weapon that is ideal for supplementing your combat style, whether your combat style heavily uses a semblance or not, is key. Yeah. Now another thing another thing that is that would be explored in one in one of the from one of these professor expositions is the nature of of um aura, semblance, and dust. Um now the way they had it the way they had dust was could best be described as elemental ammo slash poor man's materia. <laughs> yep. The More of that Final Fantasy Seven. Mm-hmm. The approach that we're going with is that dust is a is a catalyst that allows people to use something equivalent to magic, but isn't, but technically isn't. It's it's a an a magical effect, but it is not obviously true magic. Mm-hmm. As far as anyone's concerned, the idea of using magic without without a without a catalyst is the, is the stuff of fairy tales. It may have existed at one point, but it doesn't now, and is impossible as far as anyone normally is concerned. Crystals, on the other hand, are concentrated, refined forms of dust. They are they. It is not as powerful as powdered dust. But it is, far, but it is far more stable, and do, and doesn't bur- doesn't burn up as quickly. Though because of, because of the refinement process, they're not they're uncommon. I mean, Something that takes a long time to produce. Yeah, because you're a bit much in the same way that that pressure turns coal into diamonds. That's on the same principle when it comes to dust and crystals. In the in in our approach. But as any as any geologist will tell you, it takes a lot of pressure to create those diamonds. Also, I a mean, lot of time. I mean, we can create diamonds in laboratories in like sixty days these days, but we can't call them diamonds because they're not mined from the ground. They're cubic zirconium. Fuck the diamond industry. Yeah, but rails again. Mm-hmm. Now. When it comes to or when it comes to aura and semblance, um, it, aura is is a sen- is not aside from the fact that it's never it's it talk the canon material talked about souls which it which but at the same time never going into what it, what exactly a soul entails. Um, the approach that we took is this is this idea of of a of what's of a form of magic that hum, that that li- that life has that was str- was stronger at one point but is but ha- but has fa- but has faded essentially a, f- a fragment of whatever the most primitive magic humanity once had that still remains mm-hmm. Um, whether it's lost because it was stolen or whether it's lost due to misuse, we don't know. Mm-hmm. Or, or people don't people don't people in the current in the current day don't know that don't know that origin. Yep. And with that in mind, a semblance is a crystallization of that particular sliver into. A primitive form of true magic because it any semblance is is magical in nature it's very much a piece of magic and because it's a piece of magic that doesn't require a catalyst it isn't dust magic so the only other thing it can be is true magic it's just extremely specialized extremely primitive and it's not something that you can teach yeah it's also personalized since aura is different between people mm-hmm which is a good way for us to dodge the idea of aura being the equivalent of an AT field. Bum 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 bum. 
Yes, Shiro Sagisu is, is eternally banging the drums of war. <laughs> Which brings me to one minor thing that if that if we're going all in with with this bit of cheating, that will that will that we have to address. We need some bet. We need some more varied music. We need some better music. <laughs> or just. So I've I've. Oh, sorry, Monk. Go ahead. I don't. I don't mean to disparage the the soundtrack when it comes to Ruby, but an issue that I that I've had is the is the lack of identity when character themes sound sound very much are still in that vein of speed metal. And I I know one might say that I want and anyone who says that you can't do musical variety within 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 metal. Or, or even with even within power metal, doesn't doesn't have a doesn't have a clue because let me give you two words as my counter argument, Daisuke Ishiwatari. <laughs> I mean, we could just say Arxis. which still brings us to Daisuke Ishiwatari. Yes, but. The point we're getting at is, and this is something we've harped on on other series, other other media. If you don't have an identity to your soundtrack, it fails to properly bring the the types of mood and atmosphere you want to bring to scenes. It sounds generic and dull. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, uh, first of all caveat and i'm sure anyone who watched the first two episodes of this that we did remembers this when i said it last time i have never seen a single episode of ruby i watched the red trailer when it first came out thought that was cool watched the subsequent trailers for the rest of the party and was like this is this is just kind of getting boring mm -hmm. and did not pick up the series the only good song i've heard the only one that i i can legitimately remember off the top of my head is red like roses that's it and Which i know is... some i know some might dismiss zan be because he because he doesn't in he didn't in he didn't bulldoze through the entire series like i did in preparation but never underestimate the value of multiple perspectives you have myself who went through all of it you he have tortured himself for you people yeah spoiler who Tapped out, bef tapped out before I did. Yeah, I think I stopped halfway through five, and maybe the six. I and don't know. you have, and you have Zan, who's pl who's playing things by ear. But all three of us have our own perspectives, and in and in the case of Zan and myself, experience. But <laughs> getting, but getting past that, if you. Uh, if you have if you have to call up um any a YouTube guitarist or, or something like that, um do that. And I know I said that exact thing when it on the part on the inaugural episode of the Parliament of Geeks. It still it still applies. I don't care how I don't care what composer you you go with. Just Jonathan go Young. With, just go with somebody who's able to who's able to produce varied tracks so that so that if you're going to be doing character themes each of them sounds different just get jonathan young you will then get as a package deal caleb hiles uh adriana figueroa you will get uh oh what's his name toxic eternity he's cool um you'll get family jewels you'll get you'll get rashad eb you just get Jonathan Young, and you kind of get like this wide net of people who do music. Yeah, and the the I know I know that my, I know that might seem like a stretch, but if you're if you can't do that, then don't try and do character themes. If you can't if you can't do character themes with that, and you and you have to go with something a little more universal, that's going to be understood. But you can't do this kind of thing half-assed. I just wanted to get that out of my system because that's something that's always annoyed me when it comes to the art of listening to the series. Now, getting getting back to the getting back to the subject matter, um, 
obviously one of the schools that uh, one of the um, classes that would be involved at Beacon would be combat training. And in this regard, unlike the Canon series, I would not have it that that um good witch is overseeing combat training. Mostly that doesn't quite make sense. It doesn't make sense because the the way that I've the way that I've always viewed Ozpin and Good Witch's relationship early on is that Ozpin is the het, is the overall head of the school, while Good Witch handles the day to day operations of the school. Mm-hmm. In, in at risk of sounding like read another book, it's Dumbledore and McGonagall. Mm-hmm. Now, in that reg. While I while I would have while I would have a a a, a additional professor that it, that is meant to be the co- that is meant to be the combat focused guy or girl, um, I would also not be opposed to having a, to having one or two episodes of guest professors. And this is a long winded way in order to introduce Crow before he showed up in canon. Because the one of the key things in and trying to in trying to keep everything so focused on Beacon is one to make it so that it hits harder when the inevitable happens, and two that whole that whole there's a larger world out there, but we're only seeing a tiny part of it. Mm-hmm. Oh, essentially, essentially the ho- essentially hobbits with extra steps. Larger steps because, well, not everybody's as short as a hobbit. Spoiler can relate, though. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha. You're so funny. (laughs) Wow. It's a guy. Down here, salt is a way of life. Exactly. <laughs> I can feel the salt. Did, I, did I, I not say that everyone gets the roast? I wish I was wearing my salt shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but when, but because because of that, and I will admit part of the reason that I br- that I'd bring in um, Crow early on is one, he has he has to he has to go and relay it. He has to go and relay info, and two. Um, it's a good it's a good way to ha- it's a good way to have a few banter moments and have the closest thing we can to the drill sergeant from Starship Troopers' sense of humor. <laughs> because you can eat because... The enemy cannot press the button if you disable his hand. <laughs> I wouldn't go with something that gruesome, but an easy th- an easy thing is the whole who's got the guts to take me out? Somebody tr- somebody tries to Somebody tries to in, th- in thinking that he's just an easy target because he's drinking all the time, but um, as any as anyone who has watched any dr- any drunken kung fu master in any form of wuxia will tell you, they're very good at dodging. <laughs> and you can you can easily that's a fight scene that easily writes itself, albeit a one sided one of him just constantly dodging. The attacks of whoever decides th- that they can step up, with, with the lesson of, what was that? What was their first? Mis- what was their first mistake when trying to take me out? Thinking that they could. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and make and the whole time making. Ad- admittedly, this is one of those things that's that's definitely played for laughs because you need you need some degree of levity, but. Right. It it's, also lends itself to Ruby and Yang's characters because then you get to see like their family members and how they interact with them. Mm-hmm. Again, remember world building. God forbid an urban fantasy have any degree of world building. Um, Is she think any- it's sister. <laughs> Anyone, anyone who says who says that you can't do fantasy world building with ur- with urban fantasy, 
I will f I will find you and I will beat you with a copy of the Dresden Files. <laughs> until until I f un until until Zan until Zan says stop, which might be oh, for man. a while because I'm not sure if he's going to do that. How am I supposed to tell you to stop when I'm joining in? Exactly. <laughs> Now that being that being said, one of the, one of the one of the key things that w that that would be that is hinted at, and is and is dipped into a little bit is is that is the whole the whole transcript thing with um with Jean, and the whole thing of Team Strike blackmailing him. I'd still keep that just expanded a little bit more. So uh. That, not That's, stri not strike. What not strike. Uh, cardinal. Up? Yeah, cardinal. Why did I th why did I think strike? I have no idea what I was. Because you were about. just talking about. Because you were yeah you were thinking yeah. Yeah that that would certainly explain it. Plus, um, cardinal, it is is written at, is in canon written as the as what you'd expect someone to write bullies as. Stereotypical and, ones at that. Yeah. Which is fun. Which is fine when you only ha when you only have a short amount of time to do it, but since we don't have a short amount of time, we can go a little bit further with that and have them essentially be the rival fact um, team early on that uh, that constantly tries to un that constantly tries to undermine everybody, but John especially, and. One, and one of the one of the bits of blackmail is, of course, the fact that he forged his transcripts. Um, but instead, instead of using this as as some comic relief, including the shoving into lockers, which really, the approach that I'm the approach that I'm going with is that he is is not that he is a hapless victim in the whole thing that ha that has to be that has to be saved by Pira. But rather that he, rather that he is playing along until the right moment. Well, I also think that at, at one, uh, that there has to be something that makes him play along. Um, and personally, I think when he's first confronted, Jean, Jean is someone who tries to improve who they are. Mm -hmm. And he's also not someone who wants to always be trampled on. Um, I think in this respect, with the Jean that we've built, he'd go to Ozpin himself and be like, Hey, so I just wanted to let you know, um, I forged my transcripts to get in. Uh, some other students have found out, and they're threatening to expose me, so I figure it's just better I do it. That, that is something our Jean would do. Yeah. He'd go to Ozpin and be like, I forced my transcripts. If you're going to kick me out, kick me out. Mm -hmm. Which, Ozpin, which, um, we had talked about this where there was a bit of back and forth between Ozpin and Goodwitch on the matter. Mm -hmm. And Goodwitch, of course, of course, is furious about the matter, but, but then there's the realization that, one, Ozpin already figured it out. And two, nobody, nobody, nobody else was able, nobody else was able to catch it. I e, yeah. he was, I e, he was able to do a good enough job with with his with his forging that nobody spotted it. Not even Goodwitch. Mm -hmm. It was only Ozpin. So first of all, the fact that he can even do that impresses Ozpin and says, "Yeah, we're going to keep you because you have some sort of skill and you have the drive." Mm -hmm. But the, Ozpin. Or Goodwitch. Well, no, Ozpin will likely use it as an aside to Goodwitch, but in John's presence, would be, you know, the fact that he came and admitted it this early on shows to shows to his character as well. Mm -hmm. And the approach that I go with is is that Winchester does tr does try and does try and use that to his advantage. But the problem is, well, the higher ups already knew about it, and every and ev and everybody else, because they because they've seen how hardworking John is, doesn't believe him. 
So not only doesn't believe him, but, you know, the fact that Jean is not the butt of every joke and is a likable person mm -hmm. um, who does his best to help out wherever and whenever he can and is always trying to make himself better, they're going to look at him and be like, even if that is true, why the fuck do you care? And I know someone might say, well, if, if Jean's not the comic relief, then who is? I'm not a... I... I'm not of the belief of always of needing to make one character the dedicated comic relief unless it's absolutely necessary. I would rather have the I would rather have the comic relief thing be a um be a ball that's handed around. I'll give you a perfect example of where comic relief is actually handed around even if there is one character who seems like the source. Aladdin most people will point to Iago as the source of comic relief, or maybe a poo. Mm -hmm. But no, everybody gets their lumps. Avatar and The Last Airbender too. They'll say Sokka is the comic relief, but that's that's clearly yeah. untrue, and we've been through that. Right. We ta oh. We've talked about this in the past. Sokka becoming the quote-unquote comic relief was an accident. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact he is not just the comic relief. Mm -hmm. Right. And, of course, other people such as Aang, Katara, everybody. They uh, they all get their lumps, too. The, the comedy is not something that is beholden to one person. And making one person the focus of comedy will actually cheapen your jokes in the end. Yeah. Uh, I know some people... I'm a big fan of Orphan, and it could be easily said that Vulcan and Dorton are the comic relief in that one. But that's another case of everybody getting their particular roast in in ver in various ways because there's multiple ways to do comedy so the Man. idea of having Jean as the comic relief one I'm not a f uh, again we're not a fan of comic relief being just associated with one guy and two it bottlenecks the kind of stories we can tell with certain characters yeah if Jean were only ever the comic relief character there are things we just could not do with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, taking now taking all taking all that in stride, I would ha I given how we, given how um there's been this there's been this focus on um be on Beacon as a whole as a whole. That br that brings the question of how to of how to how to integrate um. Torchwick into the into the equation. Now, as far as how, as as far as how to integrate him, um, it you could you could have passing mentions of of him, meant getting into trouble, getting caught, managing to find new ways to slip out. I would have I would, however, keep keep him to keep him to a minimum in volume one and go into him. More in volume two, volume two and three. Mm -hmm. In volume one, the vi the villain end of things is Team Cardinal, and that's a villainy that doesn't last. Yeah, it's temporary. It's something that happens in all schools. There's always going to be some rivalry between people. Yeah, but just as our heroes are not one dimensional, neither are our villains. Though Team Cardinal is not going to get nearly the amount of detail as they did in the series, which even then wasn't a lot of detail, and they're not going to be sticking around very long. They'll be mentioned maybe every so often, but they but we're not going with the ever expanding cast of characters. Mm -hmm. They will realize their wrongdoings, and in so doing, attempt to improve. And I would still main I would still go with the idea of, um. Of Jean and Pira doing 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 um off hours training. Absolutely. Um, the 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 only thing I the only thing I'd really ch I'd really change is that it go is that it goes into instead of instead of going with the basics through a lot of it it goes into full on sparring very quickly. mm Hmm. And because John has been working hard. Yeah. And it doesn't and even though even though his partic his particular swordsmanship is very sloppy, 
it's n- it's not something that can be just written off either. Mm-hmm. And the only way it's going to get better is in in live combat. Yeah. That be that being said. That being said, I'd s- in canon there was that whole thing of them of them sneaking off to try and to try and interrupt a a um, a a, ra- a raid, <laughs> which I'd I'd still ma- I'd still maintain that, but I'd go- but the th- but because of how we've cha- how we've handled the White Fang. That's where a major change ends up coming. Originally, there was the, there was the mystery of why is the White Fang working with a human. In this case, the mystery is more of why is the White Fang working with a terrorist. But there is st- there is still the whole thing of the, of the, of that particular score getting interrupted and Torchwick getting getting um cornered by Ruby but managing to find a new way to escape cuz a key thing that I want to I want to stick around with Torchwick he it, the thing that he's best at is find is finding the right opportunity to take advantage of to get out, to get out of a sticky situation he's slippery and slimy like an eel mm-hmm. it's also with all of these different uh situations uh, even with Jean being bullied, um, we're still focusing primarily on Ruby in this arc. Yes. The, 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 all four of them are the primary focus because the big hurdle for Volume 1, uh, the, the reason that they are contrasted with Juniper, is that all four of them are very competent separately. They are, they are not very good. They are not very synchronized acting together yet and first off you have the fact that ruby rose does not um uh, does not see herself as a leader i.e ozpin sees something in her that she doesn't mm-hmm. um weiss has a uh, still ha- still has that still has that in t- still has that entitlement and well, want, wanted to wanted to be on the same team with with Pira, but that did but that didn't happen. Um, and that's a running gag of of Weiss attempting to make connections with Pira and striking out. Mm-hmm. And um, bl- with bl- with Blake, it's mo- it's more of the it's more of doing her doing her own thing and and not connecting all that well with her teammates. She never tells them anything. How could she? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Ruby is always being annoyed by Yang trying to shelter her, and to a lesser extent, the rest of the, uh, Bas- the team. Yeah, basically, basically trying to act, act as if she, act as if she's the leader herself, but by sheer force of personality. And because the key th- the key theme is that. And that's the reason why um, interrupting that raid would be important because it's the first coming together moment that the team has through the, through that first volume. I mean, it it comes to, it comes together in a very in a very sloppy manner, but it's st- but it still fits. It's enough that they come together uh, to be able to trap Torchwick even for that short while. Mm-hmm. And of course, in the aftermath of that, that's when you can reveal, um, C- that's when you can reveal Cinder and have her start to show up from vo- from in fu- in future volumes. Um. Now, when it comes to Volume Two, if Volume One is is me- is meant to be the is meant to be the introduction of Beacon Academy as a character. Volume two is the introduction of the of the similarly named city of Beacon, because no matter how you slice it, Beacon is Beacon is the equivalent of a college town. <laughs> it's never uh, I don't think it's ever outright sta- outright stated if it's akin to a town or a city, but 
we've seen but we've seen these kind of things before a whole community that's built or, that's built around a college or a university look no further than the rest of the city built around harvard mm -hmm. and in the, in the spirit of, in the spirit of that this is the um in the time between volumes 1 and 2 both te both teams, Ruby and Juniper, have gotten a provisional license, or or its equivalent. Basically, it means basically a means to allow them to take low level jobs with the supervision of a licensed hun huntsman or huntress. Now, it's also limited in scope, usually somewhere around the immediate area. Yeah. I.e., they could mo they, unless unless they ha unless they have specific approval. Otherwise, the most that they could do is is those low level jobs within the city. And when I say low level up, this is this is your lost this is your lost cat or tr or or um or traffic safety kind kind of jobs. The me the menial D level jobs. In other words, what Kazuma and Aqua do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, what Aqua tries to do because she's useless. There is exactly one use she has. You will never die of thirst. <laughs> but thirst in which definition? Yes. <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask the question. But with them, because of that, there's because of that, there's a lot of because, there's a lot of introduction of of the of the town as a character and kind of kind of dipping into the same territory that we did during during book one of the Korra reconstruction, where we focus so much on the the um, the peop the people that inhabited um, Republic City in the same vein, the people who inhabit the town of Beacon become. A, become a kind of recurring character in and of themselves. None of them are getting huge amounts of development, but you're going to be familiar with, cert with certain places. Like Almost. that guy who owns the book cafe that Ruby is always going to. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the... Because, because, of, because of that, with... Within the, within it, there is they're certainly do it. They're certainly doing all right at the are all right at the job, but there is that frustration of they should be doing more, and that's where you get the the whole um, the whole expedition part of part of volume two. Mm -hmm. um, of course, this is also where. I don't see a, I don't see a reason to not introduce Zwei at this point in time. <laughs> Cuz how can I hate Zwei? <laughs> <laughs> but within that within that expedition it would be on the it would be in regard to the ruins although Something is ve something is very clearly off about what's going on, because because these weird devices ha keep getting found while they're exploring, as well as the fact that the that some of the grim herds that are w that are way in the outskirts are a bit closer than their u than the usual migration route would in would indicate. Mm hmm. Of course. Ruby themselves doesn't know the migration routes, mm -hmm. but the and maybe even the hunter they're working with wouldn't exactly know. This is likely going to come from uh, a character who's going to come back there. You know, good old Uncle Crow. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll they'll explain to him all the little missions they've been doing because he's checking up on his family. So he obviously wants to hear his precious nieces tell him what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um. And they tell him about how close some of the Grim Packs have been. That's when he's going to, you know, you're going to get that, wait a minute, look on his face. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be like, that's a little closer than usual. 
It's kind of strange. And I know one might expect him to confront Ozpin about that, but I, if there's one scene that I w that I f that I felt should be should have been should have happened in canon, it is some kind of moment with uh, with some kind of quieter moment with Ozpin and Crow. Not something outright confrontational, whether it be whether it be the two of them sh whether it be the two of them sharing a drink somewhere. Sharing a drink and uh, maybe Ozpin hinting to Crow that uh, Ruby is a lot more like her mother than she seems. Mm -hmm. And Crow, you know, going, you know, I like you, but that's my family. And leaving it at something like that. It's not a, a directly confrontational. And they are having a drink and being, you know, nice to each other. Mm -hmm. But it's that implicit, that's my family. You leave my family alone, you scheming old man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the volume two volume two's theme aside from exploring more of the aside from exploring more of the city is one of a slowly boiling tension and the bo the boil over moments of that would be and would be an would be um a, det a detachment of White Fang trying to bait more gr more grim to be clo to be closer to the city, which Ruby and Ruby um, team does end up thwarting. Yeah, uh, some of the other ideas of a boiling pot that aren't directly related to conflict, though, are the fact that the city is getting more visitors. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's coming along to start setting up for the incipient. Uh, not insipid. What's the word I'm looking for? The uh, vital festival. Yeah, the incumbent vital festival. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's the word. Which um, I said. I think we said that we're treating we're treating as as a setting equivalent to the Olympics in terms of international importance. Yeah, there's going to be people from all over the world coming along. Um, so it makes sense that Crow does show up again at this time. Mm -hmm. But we also have uh, someone else come along, and it's making Weiss pretty uncomfortable. This is where this, this is where we would introduce winter, and I would still have the I would still have that same fight between Crow and Winter, but it's it's more of it's more of the fact that Crow just Crow just happens to be e either in the right or the wrong place at the right time. Depends on how you see it, and well. Winter being as straight laced as she is, and Crow be and Crow being as fast and loose as he is, sparks inevitably fly on that regard. Rain and oil. Mm-hmm. Don't mix. And while Win and um, I'd say I there's not a whole lot that we'd really need to change about Winter, although although in contrast. I'd say that she. I'd say that one thing that we go in is that she is a hardcore pragmatist, and is, yeah. and does not exactly approve of the does not exactly approve of the whole night thing and the whole noblesse oblige thing that Weiss wants to wants to embody. Yeah, that's again. That's why Weiss is quite uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. She's trying to do this thing to, to have the Schnee family once again seen as. Uh, people who are of a higher social strata that are fulfilling that noble that idea of noblesse oblige, helping those that are uh, less fortunate to themselves. Mm -hmm. And to another th another thing within another thing within that is is the is the whole is the whole ish is a a bit of the a bit of the family issue it would be explored more with with Weiss, but also this would be the time where we'd explore a little bit more into Blake's relationship with the White Fang. Oh. I know it would be tempting to ha to have her have a to have her have her have her name on a wanted list or something like that, but I wouldn't go with that. 
just not just because it's um bottlenecks the kind of stories that can be told. So mm-hmm. it could not just... to mention she hasn't done anything right now. Yeah. Um. Her de- her deal when it comes to it is that she she had fo- she had fallen in with the hero worship of of, of um Adam regarding the white fang but when adam started to get more and more extreme she she had to run mhm especially considering that i think one of the things we didn't change about her is that her parents are still the leaders of menagerie that is very much the case and the, and that pl- and that plays into a factor into a- into adam's plans mhm now Give, now taking taking all of that into taking all that into account, since I'm pretty sure we I'm pretty sure we covered every th- every major bit that we wanted to with volume two. <laughs> um, with volume three, this is where we get into the vital festival, and it's time for the it's time for one of the one of one of our favorite tropes that everyone hates for all the wrong reasons: the tournament arc. Who hates Yay. tournament arcs and why? Um, I would hate writing it, but yes, I I don't I do I I find that a lot of people hate hate the perceived overuse of term of tournament arcs, but the reason why they keep the reason why they keep showing up in at in anime and in and in other media is for one. Um, that sort of culture is something that was is something that was present in medieval societies on both e- on both ends of of the supercontinent. Yep, both both uh, you had your jousting and 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 foot tournaments in in European middle e- middle ages, and you had well <clears throat> many of the same contests over on the eastern part of Asia as well. Mm-hmm. Just... Martial prowess as a competition has been a thing since time immemorial. There'd be no difference here. Yeah. Plus, it is a reliable way to introduce a wide cast of characters and have a, and have a wide set of uh, matchups that you could that you couldn't do otherwise. Mm-hmm. It also and, means that you don't have to develop many of these characters beyond the tournament. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the tournament, um, this is also where we get to because ev- because members from all of the major nations are show are showing up here, including Atlas bringing in his aunt bringing in his um, robots, which. And which still pisses off Crow. I would go. I would go with. The, this is where we kind of go with the idea that Ozpin has a inner circle. Members members from each of the nations um, associate with him in some manner. Mm-hmm. You know, to get to this is where we start to give the idea more that Ozpin is not just what he seems. Because up until this point, he's been the friendly but a bit eccentric head ma- headmaster of the academy, and, and this reveals that he has more of a hand in things than people realize. Mm-hmm. Now, this also means that th- that some that some of the uh, some of the people from other academies are shacking up in the guest area for beacon because as, as tempting as it would be to put to put them in to put them in their own hotel in the same way that olympians do it would make far more sense for them to for them to be integrating with integrating within the student body of beacon just obviously with different uniforms and of course this is also a good way for us to have to, for us to have cinder be far more infiltrate e <clears throat> regard <laughs> regarding her position more successful in her infiltration 
Yeah, instead of an infiltration from somebody who's oh, who's only pl who's only watched someone play Metal Gear. <sighs> Metal Gear. Now, because of the because of the doing the tournament on its own isn't going to be interesting. And if you look at a lot of the better tournament arcs in fiction, there is always an underpin of of a secondary story happening at the same time. My favorite example of this: the Dark Tournament arc from Yu Yu Hakusho. Mm -hmm. Now, in our in our case, the approach we're going with is that there's been some stories of of certain people within the tournament, especially participants, getting attacked at night. Now, as far as far as who's do, as far as who's doing the attacking, that's that's basically a who done it. The uh, the red herring in this would be the white fang, <clears throat> and they certainly don't help. They certainly don't help themselves by the fact that th the fact that they're showing up as well. But of course, but of course, the real person doing it in this case would be one of one of C one of Cinder's underlings, Mercury, because well. He's supposed to be the son of an assassin, so it might do him some good to actually do some assassinating. Not to mention. <laughs> Not to mention his assassinations have a purpose. Mm -hmm. It keeps the uh, the tournament flowing in the direction she wants. Yeah. An issue that people an issue that people have had with with Cinder is. Playing, playing the, playing the suave femme fatale, but never, but never going beyond that. Yeah. And by the by the last volume I saw, she was acting the exact same, a femme <sighs> fatale who wants power. She never even really like follows up on her appearance, right? Like, she gives the appearance of being a femme fatale, but never is successful in it. Either a femme fatale or a master strategist who believes everything is going according to plan. Justice Keikaku! Translation, Ugh. no, Keikaku means plan. <laughs> A lot, but a lot of it is is more is less about is more about rub more about rubbing out um people who people who might steer the tournament in a different way more specifically making sure that t that um spe that specific char specific characters are more likely to advance in particular members of team ruby and team juniper and one might think that this is main character effect. No. It has more. It has more to do with the fact that they ha that they've been scouted and they have abilities that are going to be specific to the plans coming. Now this is a. Now this culminates, of course, with the finals. And instead of instead of doing the gimmick of full teams than smaller teams, um, I would much ra I would much rather have it just be a just be a round robin affair. Mm -hmm. Especially since we never we never we never see a tournament bracket. So if we if we don't have to use a tournament bracket, I don't see a reason why we can't do something a little different. Mm-hmm. Especially since everybody loves stats. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of Cinder's plan is the main beats of it are still what they are. There's still the whole thing of under of undermining the communications network as well as as well as causing all the grim to show up because because of what goes on, as well as the whole thing with Penny. Well, I will note I had no I have no desire to do a whole lot of development with with, Pe with Penny at this juncture because 
it's too because it's too damn early. Mm -hmm. But at the at the end at the near the near the end of things, this is this is where some of the bigger complications come in. And one of them being um, Pira being summoned to speak with Ozpin personally. And this is where we get the exposition about the Maidens. Now, this was one of the, the Maidens was one of those things that we did a significant amount of change in order to not only make them fit, but also make sure that it didn't create problems that we could, that um, were a consequence of those changes. So I th so I think this is as good a time as any to to co to cover the nature of the maidens. There are still four of them. The power of maidens is uh, is still women because the original four maidens were women. Um. Now whether or not now is it a human only thing? No. It the possibility of a faunus becoming a maiden is on the table. And in history, there have been Faunus Maidens. Mm -hmm. However, and the whole thing is that, is that in, because of the whole, we mentioned the whole true magic thing, this is where that Chekhov's gun is firing, because Maidens are, are one of the big cases of true magic. Mm -hmm. However, the taking the taking on the role of maiden comes with a price. You are a maiden first, person second is how it basically boils down to. Yeah, it's harder for people to remember you, and there there's very there's very much the risk that a lot of the people that you, that you that grew to know you over the course of your life will forget you very e well forget you significantly more easily mm -hmm. and people who deal with you maybe once or twice will vaguely remember that a maiden helped them but they won't remember which maiden and they won't if given a name they won't they likely won't remember the name and they won't remember the face mm -hmm. Maidens are a are an existence to guard something. And as part of that guardianship, they need to be incorruptible. So part of the way to make them incorruptible is to make it so that people can't remember them. Yeah. In in the canon series there was that whole thing of making the maidens a secret so that they wouldn't be utilized by um by by powers. Or, or for the, or for their safety, in th in this approach, the idea is that the ma is that the maidens have always have always existed, but this forgetfulness is a safety is a safety measure so that they're not actively pursued. Yeah, so that people do not either try to take advantage of them or kill them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Cin of course, Cinder had other ideas on that front when she at when she attacked the Fall Maiden. And even though she didn't succeed, obviously we're still keeping that. What does ha what does happen? But Pira is presented with the possibility of becoming the Fall Maiden, and it's because of because of that risk. There is that it it is a very heavy choice. Because in in canon, there is the whole con there is the whole concept of if she does this, she won't be the same person anymore. In this case, the dilemma is if she if she becomes the fall maiden, then there's the then she runs the risk of the rest of her team and especially Jean forgetting her. And by this point we've established that her and Jean have been working together very closely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Shipping that the, the, the ship teasing that the game the, the game the show uh, performs is probably a little more well established in our world. Um, 
it's very clear Jean does have very deep romantic feelings uh, for Pira. And that there may be reciprocation. They just haven't gotten to that point yet. Mm -hmm. However, there is a bit... Before the... It, right in the middle of the procedure is when every is when everything goes to hell as as Cinder had planned, and she ends up interrupting the tr the transference process. But nah, but in or in order to in order to try and take all of all of that power by for herself, which re which results it which results in the f in the fight that's seen, um. But what is? But um, this is where this is where there there is one little change that we would that we would make to this. But I want. But before that, obviously, there's the whole thing with Ruby going full silver eyes, which we're still we're still keeping. But what? But um, one thing that one thing that we would be changing. For one is. Pira is not is not um given the Thanos snap treatment. And yeah, we're not killing her off for for emotional effect. Instead, instead, I'm go instead she ends up she ends up getting th she ends up getting thrown off the top of the tower. And the. Now one might one might one might say that it's blasphemous for me to for me to do this, but there's a reason there's a reason why. For starters, because of how we do reconstructions, I'm not beholden to be as close to to source material in a slavish manner. Two, I have always had the philosophy of being against killing off a character. If there are more stories you can tell with that character, and you absolutely can with Pira, especially considering she that she's still mid story with uh, with a story she shares with John, a romance that was only teased in in source, and a romance that we're more explicitly uh, encouraging in our version. Yeah, the only time that I that I truly feel like killing a character off is when I'm is when I'm confident that there's no more stories that could be told, and even with that, if you're going to do it, you have the you do not have them go quietly into the night. There's a, that, that's that's just one more reason we like raising the death flag in Heavens and Heresies. You do not go quietly or gently into the night. You raise that fucking flag high and burn it all to the ground. <laughs> if I if I need to use a if I need to use a more contemporary example, um, Zach Fair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> God damn it, monk. If I have to suffer, so do you. Yeah, but you're not the one who literally hears that song anytime anybody mentions his name in your head. That sounds like a nomfop. What? Not black enough today to say it all out loud? <laughs> <laughs> NMFP, not my fucking problem. There you fucking go! We gave him his black back, people. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> the... The instead of, instead of ha instead of having her killed, she is she is in a she is in a coma, a um, a almost literal Sleeping Beauty. Ah, uh, that'll really suit John. <laughs> and when, when he finally builds up that courage. <laughs> Good luck. But he will. The. The approach, the approach that I'm, the approach that I'm go, the approach that I'm going is that, is that um, even the is that, the procedure was not as unsuccessful as, was as it was in canon. Some part, some part of her, di some part of P 
Pira did transfer into into Cinder, which is going to play a factor in the in the idea of her having a tug of war in her own head. It's Opiria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure if. Yep, I knew it. Your face palming, I can hear it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a lover of bad puns, that was bad. I should feel bad for it. It's too bad you can't shame what is shameless. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other th th there is of course there is of course the there, the other factor in things going to shit that I that I want to cover. Actually, I tell a lie. There's two factors. One, I'm not having Torchwick just get just get randomly eaten by a Nevermore. We have many more stories we can tell with him too. He gets to live for now. Instead, what I what does end up happening is he is a is a confrontation with um with Ruby, and just as just as he's a, just as he's about to do the do the finishing blow, he ends he ends up get he ends up getting he ends up getting um picked up. Mm -hmm. Essentially, essentially his his leash gets yanked. Because as yeah. good as Ruby is, Torchwick is better and and fights and fights like he wants to win. Mm -hmm. In other words, he doesn't fight fair. Mm -hmm. Pro tip: you never should in a life or death situation. But I didn't say that. <laughs> but the thing the thing is is that he's is that ultimately he's still answerable to um to cinder it's more, they des they describe it as a partnership but it's more of a 70 30 deal cinder's the and he go ahead i was gonna say and torchwick is the 30 mm -hmm. <clears throat> now with that with that in mind the other bit of things going to shit is Adam showing up along with along with the along with members of the White Fang to to make to make things even worse so that they can draw in more Grim because this is where it's revealed that the Grim bait that was hinted at earlier was them trying to bring the herds in closer so that when the bomb drops figuratively speaking the the Grim are able to, are able to Enter far, enter the area far more easily. Because mm -hmm. up until this point, the herds have been on the outskirts, so there hasn't really been a need to put up extreme amounts of defense. Yeah. <clears throat> this is also where we get a much more detailed understanding of Adam. Um, I know we hinted earlier saying that he is like Sharaznable. Uh, what that essentially boils down to is he is a very, very devoted pragmatist. He's determined to achieve his goal at the at whatever cost seems least costly. And much like Shar Aznabal thought that throwing an asteroid at Earth to get all Earthlings into space would solve the, the crises of the universal century... Um, Adam is not beneath doing whatever is necessary to achieve the goal of making an empire for the Faunus. He perceives the Faunus as being politically inferior to humankind, even if that isn't necessarily true, that is his perception. And because of it, he wants to show all of the humans that the Faunus can create their own country, their own empire, and play the game just as well as humans can. I know but he's some not. Might, I know some might say, but the the Faunus already the Faunus already have a place in Menagerie. Menagerie is not enough for him. He yes, and he doesn't. And I I say not enough, but he doesn't want world domination or something like that. That's not his. That's not his goal. He wishes to carve out another country, much like the four that surround the academies. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also not rabid about it this is while he is determined he is not a hot-blooded type of determination not a zealot it's, yeah he's not a, he's not a fiery zealot it's cold 
It's almost uh, machine-like rationality. And because of that, he's also willing to use whoever he wants to achieve these purposes. As part of building a Faunus Empire, he's going to need menagerie under thumb. And what better way to get menagerie under thumb than to become its ruler by marrying into its ruling class. Mm -hmm. This is the manipulation of Blake that we've uh, come up with. He doesn't give any care about her emotions, how she sees him, who she is as a person. The usefulness to him is, I marry you, I'm next in charge for the control of menagerie. And if I'm next in charge for the control of menagerie, I can put pressure on your parents to step down so I can step up and take the Faunus to their rightful empire. But he's very charismatic about the whole thing, which is, again, the other similarity with Char Aznable. He moves people because he knows how they think. Yeah. And the instead, instead, of, a, instead of a why are you making me do this a, a, approach that we've, that we've stated we're not fans of, his outburst in, in fighting against Yang and Blake is more of, is more of the fact that by by um by not by running by running away like like she did Blake is being is being difficult when it comes to his plans and and he do, and he doesn't quite care for the fact that yet that um that she that she is working with that she is working with people with people that he doesn't approve of he's he doesn't there isn't a there isn't a um human bi human bias when it comes to Adam. Adam will use humans just as much as he'll use other faunus. It has if you're useful, he'll use you. It has more to do with the fact that hit that his chess piece isn't moving the way he wants it to. No. And so when he gets angry and starts fighting, it isn't this rabid fanaticism, this why won't you do what I tell you to, uh, you know, almost je jealous, controlling, abusive ex? It's just know your place and get in line. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, he, he's, he's fighting, it, again, like I said, almost machine-like precision in thinking. So it's a lot scarier because he doesn't even seem... Uh, for lack of a better term, he, he's lost his 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 humanity, his uh his ability to emote. It almost seems like he's just not there emotionally. Mm -hmm. and it's the excess of order. Yeah. If I have to use the overused alignment system, lawful evil. With a big emphasis on the lawful, mm -hmm. and I would still have, I would still have the result be the result be similar to how it was in canon, i.e., with um, Yang getting her arm cut off. But in the interim, in the interim afterwards, you still have you still have the whole thing of all of the Grim getting petrified, and. Beacon effectively being effectively being quarantined, as well as as well as everybody trying to pick up the pieces afterwards. Include including the fact that the that um that both te both teams Ruby and teams Juniper were mo were moved over at um relocated to ru to Ruby and yet to Ruby and Yang's house. More like a cottage, if anything. And this is this is where we get one. F this is where we get one final bit of exposition. This is at, specifically where Crow reveals what he knows about the Silver-eyed Warriors. Because Ruby is now asking that question since it happened to her. 
Because as, as far as she remembers, she con she confronted Cinder, and then everything went bl everything went black, and the next thing she knew, she was in her bed. Mm -hmm. And he does reveal what he what he knows, but he but he says that there's not there's Sil silver eyed warriors were were a th were a thing from a long time from a long time ago. There's not a there is not a lot of common knowledge ab about them. Best the le but it but um some people in Haven were tr were trying to had created a name list of known of known silver eyed users at one point in time. The list is probably outdated, but maybe but maybe you can narrow things down from there. I'd say I'd say that's a better impetus for for journeying to Haven instead of um instead of Crow just saying, "Well, my investigation stopped at Haven." Yeah. And um is it obvious sequel baiting? I mean, yes, but it's good sequel baiting. There's there's a right and a wrong way to do it. The wrong the wrong way is to make is when you make it so obvious. Mhm. Mm and the other th the other thing that it, that is a bit a bit of a change is that j that um Yang is st Yang is still it is still in the state that she was after get after recovering from from get from losing her arm but and this might sound a bit of how did she how did Saber put it yanked but she yeah. she is ver she is thinking that that her confidence that she's had throughout this throughout the series up until this point is completely shot and she is she is trying to be resigned to the idea that they are completely in over their heads and should let the adults handle things which resu which um results in a bit results in a disagreement between herself and her little sister. Yep, because, good old family squabble. Mm -hmm. Cuz I know it's, I know it's cliche to have a family argument, but this is one of those cases where I think it I think it should be clear. The di Remember something's only cliche if used improperly. Mm -hmm. The the divide is pretty clear between the two. Ruby still has a degree of optimism that they can get that they can get through this in the end because of all the stuff that they've gotten through in the past that we've sit that we've by this point seen. Mm -hmm. The team is now closer knit than ever before. Um, they all have some understandings of each other's past traumas, whether it's through the confrontation with Adam showing Blake's trauma and giving Yang trauma, mm -hmm. or winter showing up and showing that that contrast between vice and winter or you know well the fact that ruby of course went silver eyes and is now looking more into that yeah and the the approach the, the approach that i'm go, that i'm going with is there is still there is still the whole thing of the team separating but some of the separations are more logical than others Weiss is still is still sent is still heading back home, and and having to deal with being being the bird in the cage, with it within within the family household. Um, Blake is he Blake um is heading to Menagerie, but it's not a case of just running off. More a ca more a case of realizing what Adam actually has planned and trying to warn her father about it. Yep, the whole oh shit! I know what's going down. I need to get back and warn them. Mm -hmm. And makes and make and instead of her running off without telling them, makes it cl makes it clear to them, I have to go back to Menagerie. That I'm pro I'm probably going to be gone for a while. This is this is something that I, this is something that I have to do myself since it's a fa since it's a family thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and. I know I, I know I've neglected him, but you but having Sun show up as show up as a stowaway, I'd, I'd still keep that. Regarding the, regarding that whole thing, and 
Sans Sans whole th whole thing as far as why as far as why he dislikes the White Fang isn't because the White Fang thinks to speak for all faunas, but more of he just he just doesn't like anybody who tries to tie him down. Because well, if you're gonna be an XP of Sun Goku, you may as well go all the way with it. Yeah, if you're gonna be the Monkey King, be the if you're gonna be the Monkey King, be the fucking Monkey King. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't have the headband, but close enough. Well, this is before he met, you know, before he pissed off Buddha and was trapped under a mountain for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. But the remaining members of Team Juniper ac accompany, um, accompany Ruby to, to uh, Haven. And Crow goes with them. Mm -hmm. Instead of following them for a few episodes and then going, then following them directly um, after after a bit. We're instead going with the idea of they need a chaperone, and he's the and he's the best or worst person for the job. Whether he's he got it, he got to keep the little bit babbies on a leash. Whether he's the best person for the job or the worst person for the job depends on who you ask. Ruby's gonna say he's he's the worst just because she doesn't want her uncle looking over her shoulder. Oh. Uncle, I can do this on my own. Eh, your dad would kill me. <laughs> Let's not forget that their dad is... is we, we have changed nothing about him. He is completely devoted to his daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, so, oh. if Crow was like... If Crow didn't keep an eye and he told him that, he'd be like, you let them go on their own? You fucking let them go on their own? I'd say an, then, I'd say an easier way for way to do the gag is Ru, is Ruby believing that she, that she needs that she needs to do that she can do this without Crow's help, but but Crow Crow saying you're Crow I'm well, just saying certain certain people would say other certain people would think otherwise and he he je he gestures right behind him and uh, and off in the distance is, <laughs> is Ruby's father just staring. <laughs> I mean, Yang has to get it from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's clearly not, not, uh, not going to be anything else, right? And uh, when I say when I say when I say staring from a distance, you know the you know the age old gag of someone peeking around the corner or pe or peeking up from something to give the good old gee. Yeah, that kind of stare. Nice. Doesn't isn't saying anything, but is very, but, but is very, but is very threatening. Mm-hmm. Oh. And of course, of course, you still have you. While it is tempting to still have the to still have the post credit scene that that finally shows um, Salem. I am electing. To, I'm electing for this to shift it a little bit. Instead, instead of just Salem doing that, doing that monologue of "I can't wait to see you all burn," I would rather have it that she that um Cinder Cinder ends up showing up at Salem's throne for better for lack of a better term. Do um about to give her report, but she ends up seeing Pira out of the corner of her eye, turns around and is just not there. Mm hmm And Salem obviously asking, is there is there something is there something wrong? And the whole thing gets brushed off, even though there's clear even though it, that's clearly not the case. You know, I'm going to say it. This reminds me of Baron Baron Harkonnen's memories in Arya's eyes during Emperor of Dune. Well, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Indeed. <laughs> and for me, this is a way this is a way to keep the presence of Pyrrha within the story even though she's out of commission. Or and, now. And the possibility of later on having some internal dialogue with with Cinder. If I were to use a analogy, consider um 
Consi consider the back and forth with Terra and Xehanort. I know that's a bit of a stretch, but it's one example you can go with. It, it is a bit of a stretch, especially since it's written by Tetsuya Nomura, but we won't get into that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that is the... While there's obviously some little details that we glossed over, that is the bullet points of how we'd handle this beacon arc of our reconstruction. We have... We have a ca we have a cast that we're focusing on, one th one that has has their own bit of baggage that they're that they're trying to get over. And while we didn't we didn't cover a lot of the baggage when it comes to when it comes to Team Juniper, that that's something that we will get that we will get more into with time. We ha we have the elements of of how a lot of this a lot of the world building that we previously established plays out within this approach the fa the fall of beacon has far is has far more impact because we've spent we've spent um close to tw close to 20 or so episodes getting to know beacon and the and the city that surrounds it yep well we didn't go into detail with that sort of exploration it's in there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the entire reason I said that offhand remark about, you know, the owner of the book cafe that Ruby always goes to. Um, you're going to have these settings that characters are going to have as their favorite setting, especially what we know of their proclivities. Uh, and you're going to see those locations pop up a bit, quite a bit, as, as we have a lot of episodes to explore things that aren't just those quick and dirty bullet points that were the original net series. Yeah. Now, some I know there might be the argument that I, that by by bringing in all these changes that I'm turning Ruby into some into something else. Welcome to how we do reconstructions. Mm -hmm. This was the reason why the original um, setup that that we did we abandoned because we felt that we were being too reactive to the to the original source material, and. I had stated plainly when we did this remastered version, I wanted to make explicitly sure that where we ended, by the time we were done with volume with our volume three, we were we were going in a completely different pace, completely di completely different direction. The snowball was starting to roll down the hill, which we have done. Mm -hmm. And. This will make th this will make these subsequent volumes interesting because instead of, instead of being constrained into setting up a foundation, we'll be able to explore what we've set up here. Yep. We now can as, build upon the changes made. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as when as far as when that next one will come, that'll probably be in a few months. It I do want to space these kind of things out because there's plenty of other ideas that I want to explore. With Geek Watch, as as we have done as we have done throughout this. Now, with all with all that in mind, as far as what we as far as what we've got coming next week. Well, <sighs> next week at next week we'll be roasting a certain game studio that um is bet is seems to be better at canceling their own games than making them. <laughs> and after after that, Good Brother Shades will ha will have his t will have his time in the spotlight. And of co and of course, I do I do have a few interviews that I'll be do that I'll be doing throughout the week, including including a and there will also be a discussing video once again because a certain YouTuber that Zen and I are familiar with a couple weeks ago decided to be a, a bit of an idiot. <laughs> bit is a, is an understatement. It was it was more like it was more like weapons grade copium. Weapons grade copium and the inability to let go. Oh. There are a few of the interviews will be with Will be with people who are going to be a bit more familiar, and of course on Friday there will be the, there will be the first part of one of one of the bigger <laughs> entries 
in Zan and I's run through of Veil of the Void. Is... <sighs> Dear God, that's going to be an iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> a fun iceberg, but an iceberg nonetheless. And just remember, folks, use code 2MONKS to get 10% off your purchase of Veil of the Void. I I am still so happy that Trevor did that. But, as always, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs> <laughs>